You'll no doubt have seen lots of the videos and the news about the TikTok prankster Mizzy. You might have even caught our video over on Art, Media and Law channel with myself and Alan Robertshaw, although it's Alan Robertshaw presenting that video. And lots of people have asked about the position of someone like that coming into your house and using self-defense against them. So that's what I'm going to explain broadly in this video. But first of all, back to Mizzy. So he was issued a two-year criminal behavior order on Wednesday, as explained by our Alan Robertshaw over on our other channel. Make sure you subscribe to that below because of his invading of people's houses without permission. Uh, that was on Wednesday of last week. And now he's been back in court and remanded into custody for breach of that court order. Because breaching a court order is a very serious offence, which very often will attract custody. And so he's been remanded into custody, meaning that there's at the very least a high likelihood of being being convicted of the offence of breaching the order, and of course the possibility of him being imprisoned. Now for those of you that are not familiar with what he's been doing, he was going into people's houses, just wandering in without permission, causing them alarm and distress, approaching women in the street, asking them if they want to die, stealing a woman's dog in front of her and then running off, and also assaulting an orthodox Jewish man by trying to leapfrog him. So all of these things that he's obviously done for attention and clicks and to grow his social media channels have landed him in court and now remanded him into custody. So now lots of people naturally ask, well, what if that happens to me? What if someone comes up to me in the street or comes into my house? What am I able to do about that? Well, this all comes down to self-defense. If it's out in public, it's sort of simple self-defense, but if it's in your house, then it's what we know as a householder case. Let's talk about those in turn. If you're out in public, self-defense is a two-part test. First of all, a subjective test on whether you genuinely believe the circumstances call for it to be necessary to use force to defend yourself or others. And that includes whether you're mistaken or not. It includes whether it's a prank or not. If somebody came up to you and said, do you want to die? Then you can genuinely believe that they might want to harm you, in which case you might feel that it's necessary to use force to defend yourself. You don't have to wait to be attacked. This is known as a preemptive strike. You can attack first to defend yourself and that can amount to self-defense. That is the first subjective test whether you genuinely believe the circumstances call for the need to use force. So it's necessary force to defend yourself or others. The second part of the test is whether that force used is reasonable and proportionate. Standard self-defense requires that it is proportionate and reasonable force. And that is an objective test. Would an ordinary, reasonable, sensible person think that the amount of force you've used is reasonable and proportionate in those circumstances? But then a rather famous case many, many years ago went to court where Tony Martin was originally convicted for murder, which was later reduced to manslaughter by diminished responsibility and set off a huge countrywide debate as to the, how far the laws on self-defense go. This is because he disturbed two burglars in his farmhouse out in Norfolk. He fired at them three times with a shotgun and killed one of them and seriously harmed the other. Now this obviously set about a huge political and public debate, resulting after many different private members' bills at the House of Commons resulted in the government legislating in 2013 to make amendments to Section 76 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act of 2008. This made provisions for what we now refer to as a householder case, and these sections provide that the degree of force used is not to be regarded as having been reasonable in the circumstances that the defendant believed them to be if it was grossly disproportionate in the circumstances. And in a case other than a householder case, the degree of force used is not to be regarded as being reasonable in the circumstances if it was to be disproportionate in those circumstances. So the difference is in the wording here of being grossly disproportionate. So you can be disproportionate in your use of force in a householder case and it still be self-defense. The key is the distinction with being grossly disproportionate. For example, you see burglars come into your house, let's say you hit them with something and they are knocked unconscious and then you call the police, they come and take them away. But if you were to repeatedly hit them while they're on the floor, that would obviously be grossly disproportionate because they're already unconscious, they're already incapacitated and it would be grossly disproportionate to continue doing that to them 
in that moment. So now, just to summarize, the position with a non-householder case, which is anything other than being in your own home or your own property or your own dwelling and things like that, that if the force is disproportionate, then it defeats the defense of self-defense. If it is a householder case, then it needs to be grossly disproportionate to defeat the defense of self-defense. But let's come back to the word of proportionate for a moment, because let's say if someone is genuinely threatening your life and you genuinely believe them to be threatening your life and your response is quite severe, this might still be held to be proportionate if a jury accepts that it was reasonable force in the circumstances that you genuinely believe them to be, even if you were mistaken. So even if it was a prank and you were mistaken about them actually intending to seriously hurt you, if your force was quite severe, it, would, it could still amount to a reasonable force used in by way of self-defense if a jury accepts it. The risk that you have, of course, is that if a jury and you are charged with harming this person and a jury does not accept that you used reasonable force in the circumstances that they've accept that you genuinely believe them to be, then your defense may fail and you yourself might be convicted of causing serious harm. So as always, it is not entirely straightforward as if someone attacks you or threatens to attack you, you can do anything you want, of course not but it is a matter of degrees and it's a matter of if you are ever accused and charged with harming somebody by using what you believe to be self-defense it is a question of firstly whether it is accepted that force was necessary in those circumstances and secondly whether or not that force was reasonable in a non-householder case or in a householder case whether it was not grossly disproportionate. And of course, in any case like this, prosecutors will consider all of the circumstances, including whether or not the use of force was used against those that are in the act of committing crimes. And just as a final point, lots of people have asked about using an object or even a weapon to defend yourself whilst in your own home, if someone else is breaking in and commit or committing any other kind of crime in your home. Now, as I might have mentioned previously, there is no specific definition of reasonable force. So it would always come down to what a jury accepts or in the magistrate's court, what the magistrate or a district judge accepts. However, in the heat of the moment, you could, in theory, use any object as a weapon and it would become a weapon because you've picked it up with the intent of causing harm with it, clearly harm in self-defense, but harm nonetheless, making any everyday object a weapon. For example, a tripod such as this one here. If I picked it up with the intent of hitting somebody with it, that makes this a weapon. You can, in theory, use any object as a weapon to defend yourself in your own home, providing that it, as I said, it is not grossly disproportionate under the same test. However, you will come under severe scrutiny if you, as I said before, you carry on attacking the intruder, even though the, the immediate danger has passed and you ought to call the police or they're running off and you give chase and you keep hitting them and things like that. Or if you've planned traps such as like, I don't know, a trap door or something out of Home Alone. If you make these kind of traps that severely hurt somebody, then of course that is likely to get you into trouble as well. As to the question of actually using a weapon per se, which would be something that is made or adapted to cause harm, as opposed to something you just pick up and intend to cause harm with, that might make it even more difficult. That's not to say it's impossible that it will succeed as a self-defense in that if a jury accepts that, let's say, for example, you picked up a baton, which is, you know, not a knife, not a gun or something else, but it's a wooden truncheon of sorts, which is made with at least one purpose of causing harm, it would be, in my view, more difficult to argue that it's not grossly disproportionate if you use a weapon, but still a jury may well accept that it hasn't gone to the point of being grossly disproportionate, even though you've used a de facto weapon as opposed to something you just pick up. However, that comes with the difficulty that the more dangerous the weapon, the more likely it's going to be grossly disproportionate and the less likely a jury will accept that it was reasonable and not grossly disproportionate. In other words, if you used a weapon and caused serious harm with it and a jury found that that was grossly disproportionate, then your defense of self-defense will fail and you'll likely be prosecuted and convicted 
of some serious harm, such as GBH or whatever. And if anyone is interested in a civil citizen's arrest, I discuss that in great deal in a number of other videos, at least one of which I will link in the description below. And just as one final thing, I promise, if you are interested in learning the skills of self-defense, including the use of weaponry to protect yourself and your family, check out my link in the description below to our Polarm Close Quarters Combat Skills course, in which I, along with several other military and special forces veterans, will be teaching the same skills that are taught to the special forces so you can protect yourself and your family. Those are going on in July and September. Check out the link below. So in the meantime, please hit that like button and subscribe. Make sure you do subscribe because about 60% of you don't and I really appreciate it when you do. And as always, thank you for watching.